through this epistle, tackling chapter 3 this morning, the first seven verses concerning elders. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful that as you have through the divine inspiration through the Apostle Paul by the Holy Spirit allowed Paul to pen these words so that the church would be in order rightly. I'm grateful for my brother Roger as we serve in this capacity, praying in advance as I already did for future men that you would direct to be elders in your church, both here at Redeemer and elsewhere. Teach us, Holy Spirit. And even whether one is not an elder, or if they are, to see your word and the importance of it in our lives as believers. So bless this time for your glory and for our good. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen simple question, but maybe not so simple to answer. Have you ever sat before an elder board? Not in an informal setting per se, like in their home or at uh, some restaurant or a coffee shop, but also not in the context of church discipline, because usually when we think of sitting among the elders, typically, in most cases, in many cases, it is because there has been a process of church discipline that is at various stages. So I'm asking this more in the context of a non-disciplinary issue. Have you ever sat with the elders at an elders meeting? Yeah, thank you, I appreciate that. (laughs) You know, it's interesting, and I think based on many years as an elder and serving in this capacity, I, I, I think I can say with some certainty that most, if not All, perhaps, not all, you can't qualify to that extent, have not sat among the elders at an elders meeting in a more formal setting. As a matter of fact, it's probably one of the last places you would rather be to be sitting, perhaps, among your elders, per se. I mean, think about it. How many of you would say to another brother or sister, hey, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't meet with you, I can't come together, I have a very important meeting, I'm, I'm going to go to my elders meeting and talk to them. All the while thinking, okay, they're probably thinking, well, what did you do wrong while you're meeting with the elders? It just doesn't happen these days. Or, or, or what about, taking it on the flip side, what about the elders coming to visit you? at home, particularly, perhaps in an informal setting like a coffee shop or a restaurant? Does it make you nervous? Does it make you anxious? Does it make you excited, (laughs) fearful? I mean, all, all these different, you know, some perhaps would even say, feel kind of proud. I've never had an elder in my home. Maybe there's an issue there of why the elders perhaps may need to come and be in your home dealing with pride, perhaps. But does this word come to mind concerning elders and being with the elders? Welcoming. I appreciate what one writer said as he was talking about this and contemplating this and considering a time with the elders to be a happy place. Now, there's a lot of talk about be everyone finding their happy place, but we're not going to go there. But he's talking about this in the context of the, being with the elders, even in a formal setting of an elders meeting, to be a, a, a happy place to be. And so he tells this story. Back in the 19th century, a churchman from Edinburgh named David Dixon wrote this, quote, Our people know well the necessity and usefulness of the office of the eldership. All over Scotland, there is a happy prejudice in favor of an elder's visit. No elder could ever say that they did not welcome his visit. 
The houses and hearts of the people are ever open to those whom they have called to the office, end quote. This is how elders ought to be treated with this type of affection. And I understand being in that role of an elder is not always the case. I, I wish it were more so in the church at large. Speaking for Redeemer, I'm grateful to serve, and, and Roger and I, as we've discussed this, to serve in this capacity and to, to, to be elders and under-shepherds to serve the sheep. But you, but you see, in many churches, both elders and congregates only have this mindset of meeting together in the sense of discipline or if they're upset with the elders or things need to change at the church. It's usually in a negative context. So maybe we just have to rethink how we think about coming with the elders. I, I have always said the elders meetings are always open. They're the second and now they, we've changed, but they're the second and fourth Wednesday of the, of the month. And if you just want to sit down and, and chat with the elders, bring concerns. Bring your joys. So we can pray with you. Now again, I, I confess, we need to do a better job of that outside of that kind of formal context. W what's interesting in coming to this text particularly in the qualification that Paul lays out here is how he's trying to get Timothy and the church at Ephesus to think about the leaders that God has placed over them and what that looks like turn over to titus chapter one quickly so first timothy second timothy titus chapter one and beginning in verse five let me read verses five through nine paul writes to titus under the inspiration of god the holy spirit he writes this this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be an arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction and in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So even Titus gets some instruction on how to set up elders to oversee the churches there in Crete. And so this morning, as we come to this particular text, He's already laid out earlier in chapter 2 roles and responsibilities of men and women. Now he's just going to kind of bring this home a little more as to the leaders who are there. And so would you follow along now back in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. May the Lord bless the reading of his word as the Holy Spirit makes right and proper application. This morning in considering these seven verses here, our aim is to come away from this text to see that what God has ordained regarding biblical eldership is good and it's right despite the cultural pressures that may be placed, whether it's from without or from within, in what biblical eldership looks like. And so Paul lays out these qualifiers, these qualifications uh, for a man who seeks and desires or is called or asked to be an elder, part of what is known as a plurality of elders in the local church. And so he starts off there in verse 1, 
as he begins to get into these positive qualifications, this saying is trustworthy. And so th he begins with what he's already said, once at least, because he'll say it four times, the saying is trustworthy. We saw it back in verse 15 of chapter 1. Here in chapter 3, he'll say it again in 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 11, and then even in Titus, chapter 3, verse 8. This is a, this is a worthy saying concerning eldership. If anyone aspires or feels drawn to serve in this way, and some do, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. And you may be thinking, and I've heard this statement, I never want to be an elder. Knowing the dynamics of their particular church body, they're saying, why in the world would I even want to consider this? And yet, God calls men to desire to do this. Uh, this. As I've said, I think I said it in the introduction to 1 Timothy, this is the text that God used, the Holy Spirit particularly used in my calling to ministry. To be an under-shepherd, to serve as a pastor in this capacity, which brings some nuances, which we'll get into just briefly, shortly. But if anyone desires or aspires to the office of overseer here, and that, that word in its original means one who will uh, oversee, obviously, superintend, exercise oversight, and care of the body, the flock that God has brought to them. Timothy, you and others around you are to care for and oversee the flock that is there in Ephesus. In the biblical pattern that God has placed is a plurality of elders. You see that in Ephesians, where Paul pulls the Ephesian elders together. Now, there are certain times that a plurality is, is not able to be in place. We've seen that in our own experience as a church prior to becoming a particular church in the Bible Fellowship denomination. But that brings inherent dangers, perhaps. Abusive leadership, an authoritarian leadership. And so he, Paul is reminding Timothy and the church, if anyone aspires to this office, he desires a noble task, even though it is not always easy. It has its great joys and it has its deep sorrows. But this is our calling as under shepherds, as, as elders, as overseers. And a lot of times you will see throughout Scripture, overseer, elder, pastor, the titles are interchangeable. And so what I see as elders are a group of pastors shepherding the flock. They may not have the official title of pastor, but they are pastoring. And to, to see it that way. So he lays out this kind of statement to say, look, here is something that you must believe in. This is a very trustworthy saying and the importance of what God has ordained for these leaders over you. But in calling them, here are the qualifications for them. And so he lays out these positive characteristics or positive qualifications. And again, it really points to the, the gravity of the labor that they will partake of. This is the model he expects not only Timothy, but those men around him to exemplify. Not only then, but now for the local church. And so, before even getting into these qualifications, I would just frame it out with this statement. Men, have you considered being an elder? And so, I, I, I lay that question out again because I think it's something now God may call through the Holy Spirit directing them, but through putting other men in their lives to consider that, asking a question, and what that means. So let's consider the, the qualifications then, even in light of that question. First, they are to be above reproach. That was mentioned in Titus chapter 1, verse 5. They're not sinless. It's not sinless perfection. But their character is free from scandalous sin is the idea that Paul is getting there. And again, with the false teachers that were in place, there were probably men that took on the authoritative position that should not have been there outside of the church as Timothy's dealing with these false teachers. 
And so there were these men putting themselves in this authoritarian position within the church that they may have started that should never have been there to begin with because they were not above reproach. He, he goes on, the husband of one wife. And I think this is very important to consider this and what that really means, considering what he's already said there in chapter 2 and the role of leadership within the context of the local church. Now, what's interesting with, with this phrase, and, and so what you can come away with on one side is this, to be the husband of one wife means that you can only be married one time, and if you are divorced, widowed, single, you're disqualified. Some have interpreted it that way. I disagree with that interpretation. I, think it's, I don't think it's a right interpretation there. I think what Paul is getting at is this one who is married, he is committed to that one wife at this time. So you may have an issue where biblical divorces happen. And so a man is qualified, it doesn't disqualify him. He remarries biblically. And he may be considered for an elder. It doesn't mean that every elder has to be married. Paul himself was single as far as we know and can tell from what's written. If we take this that they must be married, we are excluding men who are qualified. That by that interpretation would disqualify them. I don't, that's not what Paul's saying here. I mean, more often than not, the men would be married. And so he's addressing them. You are the husband of that one wife. He deals with the issues of polygamy in the culture. And he talks about their role there. So when he lays out this qualification, the husband of one wife, he's concerned about those who are married, not to disqualify those who are widowed or even single. In, in, in a sense here, he's saying, look, there is an expectation for those of you who are married. And he'll, you see how this ties in later on with children in the home and what, what that means. What, what he's saying here, it seems, is he's trying to get this point across. If you are married, be that example before the church in your marriage. That covenant promise you have taken with your wife. So the elder is to be the husband of one wife. He's to be sober-minded. Here, the, these next set of qualifications deal with the issue of judgment in the elder. To be sober-minded, not to be paranoid, but to be alert to situations around him, both internally and externally. Noticing the spiritual needs and the warnings that are there of the sheep that you shepherd. And, and quite honestly, sometimes we, we miss some things and we need the body coming around other members of the body and say, have you talked to the elders about this? Shared your concerns with the elders about this? Sometimes it may take someone else in the body to share that concern with the elders on behalf of someone else. We, we try to be mindful of these, to be alert to those happenings. He's to be self-controlled. He's to be sensible in their decision-making, to be balanced. And this is the beauty of the plurality of elders. Now, again, if you notice, nowhere in Scripture does it say you need to have X amount of elders in the church. Nor does it say, and, you know, I mentioned the bylaws. We, we talked about this, and some churches do do this, and there's nothing wrong in that. But they would put into their bylaws, perhaps, we want... X number of elders for X number of people in the church, kind of like little shepherding groups, which is wonderful and great. But it could also pigeonhole a church to force them, particularly if it's in your bylaws, to have men in the role of an elder that really shouldn't be there. So we need to be sensible in our decision-making, and sometimes those decisions and coming to those conclusions are really difficult and challenging. Look at what we went through with COVID. Look at what we go through as I prayed in a political climate. Let alone just body life together. Family issues. 
And so the elder is to be self-controlled and be sensible in its decision-making, to be respectable, to be well-behaved, respected by others both inside and outside the church, to be hospitable. This is what the elder does. The idea there, and Paul using that word hospital, is to open their doors to strangers. And what that means, and, and that can be done in many ways. Literal strangers, as travelers were coming through, they had no place to stay. An elder would open up their home to a complete stranger, inviting them in for a place to stay and to feed them. We see that perhaps in missionaries that are passing through that we may know, inviting them to stay for one night or a period of nights. To serve others that are going about the kingdom work. That's the idea here. So we, we, we see this even to be hospitable. We sometimes think of this in regards to evangelism. Now, again, this isn't being hospitable so you can get your, your lost neighbors or friends or, or fellow students into your house and then all of a sudden you lock the doors and now you're really going to get them with the Ten Commandments. It's, it's not saying that. There's pieces of that that come together. There's relationships that have been built in to invite them. Some may come, some may not. But caring for others, particularly in the congregation, opening our homes, and that can be done in various ways and at various times. And, and again, on, on the flip side of that, in this qualification for an elder, there's a responsibility on those who are being invited. You know, you're not there, well, I've never been invited to the elder's house. Some of that just may simply be scheduling and trying to work calendars out. But we are to be hospitable, to open our homes. We, we, I, I've seen articles, and I've mentioned this in the past, messy hospitality, an article on messy hospitality, not worrying about being, having our houses crisp and clean perfectly. Yes, we want to clean them. I'm not discouraging to have a clean house or anything like that, but... You know, sometimes our houses, if, if, if an elder is young and has small children in their house, they may have toys all over the floor. And that's okay. He goes on, he must manage his household well with all dignity. The idea here with this word manage has two primary meanings. One is he's managing his household to supervise over it. And then the other idea in managing is to be concerned about it. So it ties the two together to be concerned in order to supervise his house. He, what he isn't saying here in verse 4 that he must manage his own household well because he gives that qualifier with all dignity, and we'll come to that. But as you think about the text that was there in Titus about having children, does it el should it, is an elder required to have children? Now later in going through Titus... We'll see, and so I'll let that out, that it's not that he must have children, but if he does have children in the household, here's the expectation in there. If he does have children, his house must be in order. It means his children heed his authority, not that the elder is this authoritative figure. It's my way or the highway. Now, there's aspects to parenting that come in we, where there is commands given and obedience expected. We're back to Ephesians 6, and children obeying your parents in the Lord for this is right. But managing his household with all dignity, encouraging his children to seek out obedience because that's what they're called to. That word dignity ha carries the idea of respect or reverence. It, 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 it comes back in how children have the respect towards their, their father, particularly as an elder. Now, as parents, we, there are things that we expect and even demand from our children. Not so much so that we are exasperating them, though, as Paul also reminds us as fathers. When he asks this question in verse 5, as he continues, he must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. Again, it's not this iron fist over them, this rule over them. 
but that they are obedient. Verse 6, he must not be, or I'm sorry, verse 5, if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? You see the correlation there. And that is a challenge. Every parent knows that. That word manage there harkens us back to Luke's gospel in Luke chapter 10 in the parable of the Good Samaritan that Jesus lays out there. How the Samaritan came by and it says there in verses 33 and 34, then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. He managed him. Because managing always involves sacrifice. I mean, do you not think that good Samaritan had his own schedule and busyness of what he wanted to accomplish that day? And yet he took the time out to care for this one who was laying by the side of the road. It, it, it comes to an issue of being inconvenienced. And sometimes we've had this discussion even in our home, and I'm sure many other elders have had this discussion. Balancing out church needs and family needs. And to understand what that looks like and how to respond rightly to those. Finally, then, in verse 7, on the positive qualifications, moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. How is his reputation outside of the church? At work? In the community? His neighborhood? Is he a beautiful witness to those that he is in contact with? Do they think well of him? It ties back there in verse 2 to that word respectable. It's, it's not those in the community saying, oh, that guy goes to church? No. They'll say, that guy goes to church. How is he viewed by outsiders? These are the positive qualifications, but then he goes in verses 3 and verse 6 to some negative qualifications concerning the elder. So quickly, let's just work through these there in verse 3. First, he's not a drunkard. He is not lingering long beside the wine is the idea that Paul's carrying there. It's pretty self-explanatory. This is not his constant companion leading to drunkenness. That he's considered a drunk. which then gets into all kinds of side conversations concerning the believer in drinking. We're not going there. But I think the, the qualification is pretty clear in what it's implying. The wine or the strong drink is not his constant partner. He's not violent but gent gentle. The, the idea here Paul's getting at is this is one who's not a brawler. He's not looking for a fight. He doesn't actually get into a fight. You may have heard of church meetings and elders literally getting into fist fights. It has happened. I've never been part of that. Never been in a church that's been a part of that. I never want to be a part of that. Those are the ones that make the YouTube videos. <laughs> Unfortunately. Paul says they are not to be violent. So perhaps those false teachers who are placing themselves in this position of authority come across this way and were literally picking fights with those who disagreed with them. I mean, look at 2 Timothy with me quickly in chapter 2, just over a few pages. We're again speaking in reference to elders and the Lord's servant, verse 24. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And so they're not violent, but they're gentle. Now, he, he'll follow that then, getting in from being not violent but gentle, but not quarrelsome. What is Paul saying? Are, are, is an elder never to be argumentative? 
I believe there's a time and a place where you can have disagreement among elders. And we have. I, very honestly, I don't know of any elder board that I've ever been on or talking to my fellow pastor friends and fellow elders that haven't had disagreements on the elder board. But they're not constantly looking for every nitpicky little thing to be uh, negative about. And that's the idea Paul's getting at here. It, it's okay to express opinions about how we may do something on a Sunday or what ministry we're to start or who even we should ask and consider as an elder. These kind of conversations. I mean, some of the best decisions come out of the most lively discussions. And you know what I mean by lively. Animated. Again, even in those discussions, not only the elder, but every Christian, we've got to guard our heart. That anger isn't there at the very root of that discussion. I mean, on occasion, it may be even appropriate to raise objections to an issue that's been raised. But never to be done with a contentious spirit. In the life and ministry of church life, as elders, yes, you always want unanimity, whether we're voting on something pertaining to the church, but it's not necessary always. Now, we only have two elders, so it's pretty easy, but when you talk about wards that have, you know, five, six, seven, ten, some churches have 20 plus elders. We want to be in agreement, and we want to seek unanimity, that we all agree, but sometimes that doesn't happen. It doesn't mean that the elder board is quarrelsome all the time over everything, but sometimes we just got to hash things out and work through all the issues. These, these are the things, so now you, you get kind of a, a, a peering behind the curtain, so to speak. As, I, as, I, as, I, blah, blah, blah. as I've said to some people, uh, until you sit on the other side of the table so to speak, it, it gives you a whole different picture. Not quarrelsome. I mean, even I think Paul has in mind here, as he's speaking to Timothy, not only internally for the elder board, but even externally uh, between the sheep and the under-shepherd. He goes on, not a lover of money. Did you know that being rich is not a disqualification for being an elder? Absolutely. But they're not a lover of money. What do they do with the money they have? God uses those who have accumulated wealth, but how are they serving the church and the ministry, the kingdom work with the money they have? Some people will say, you could even take this, usually, you know, if we think about this in a right perspective, those who usually have accumulated wealth have done well in a business, in their profession. Therefore, because they've done well, therefore that qualifies them to be an elder. And I say flat out no. It may qualify them to be an elder, according to these qualifications. But just there, because they're a president or CEO of some bigger company, even smaller company for that matter, doesn't necessarily mean they would make a wonderful elder to serve the church. Do they love money? I mean, that's why the writer of Hebrews there in Hebrews 13, 5, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Finally then, in, in this qualification here in verse 6, Lays out some things. He, he must not be a recent convert. You know, here lies the one qualifier that disregards the age of an elder. Did you think about it? Ever think about it that way? Some will say, well, I don't, I don't think this young man should be an elder because of his age. That may be the case. But never in the qualification do we say an elder must be, you know, 35 plus. He 
must not be a recent convert so he doesn't get puffed up and proud and fall into the condemnation of the devil. That one who is not able at that time in his faith journey to, to defend doctrine. There are, there are some men, and I've served along some, some young men, who were just so, um, had so much wisdom, biblical, theological wisdom, that the elder board needed them to come alongside of the rest of the elder board and bring that biblical wisdom there. I mean, th honestly, this is the thinking that's there. Maybe that's been your thinking. Maybe you, you've been in a church that had this thinking. There is a component of, of wisdom that is gained just from life experience. But being under 30 doesn't disqualify someone necessarily unless they are a new convert. Paul says here, consider his spiritual age, not his biological age. And why? Because they'll become proud, thinking they have, uh, and you, you see that both in younger men and even in older men being elders. There is this position and expectation. And, and sometimes elder boards can get this way. Thus says the elders. Now, I need to qualify that and quantify that. There are decisions elders make that are pertinent to the life of the church and the life of the body together. And so there is that component and, and with leadership. But this is the danger, too, of elder boards and, and particular elders taking that authority that is, is granted to them to oversee the life of the church and run with it in a way that God did not intend. Now, that's where, by God's grace, you have other elders coming around them. And this is the beauty of the plurality of elders and eldership. To have those other men come around them and say, listen, brother, you are way off base. You need to get off that high horse and just come back down and stand on the ground and even sit. You're way out of line. But Paul says, look, and, and we're not given the whole context of, of the men that were in the church there in Ephesus and what age demographic they were in. But negatively, he must not be a recent convert. And then, uh, you know, just to, to kind of bring this to a close, then questions come up, but, but what about this? What about this situation in the past? Does that disqualify them? Does it qualify them? Perhaps it may. It may not. Some will say, but what about grace? What about forgiveness? Yes, grace and forgiveness are there, but it still may disqualify someone. Think of the Israelites. They sinned against God. They wandered in the desert for 40 years. And what was the consequence, even though there was forgiveness and there was repentance, continuous repentance and forgiveness, and yet they didn't enter the promised land. Sometimes the choices we make in life have lifelong consequences. So it could be yes, and it could be no. And, and this is where I, I believe, and we believe as, as a board, w that we trust you as a congregation are trusting us to make those decisions. Doesn't mean you can't ask questions. Does it, it doesn't mean you may even have to just flat out agree. You may have disagreement. That's why I asked the question at the beginning, have you ever sat in an elders meeting? Sometimes it just means there's just misunderstanding of words without judging motives. But we do see sometimes there are things that happen in a person's life that may hinder them from serving in this role, even when they desire it. And so two things in closing, both dealing with prayer. Pray for biblical wisdom and discernment for the elder board, for the elders of Redeemer Church. Currently, the elder board consists of myself and Roger Eastman. Pray for future men who would serve as elders at Redeemer Church. Pray for unity for that board. For those of you that, that have been in on boards or served in various capacities as officers of a 
of a business or anything like that, there, there's disagreement. That's not necessarily bad. Because we work to try to get at what is exposed as our own heart motives, but what's best for the church, for Christ's church. Pray for the elders for wisdom and discernment in, in regards to leading. When the culture just presses in so hard at times. It takes so many things going on in the culture. Who knows if protesters will show up here? That was on live stream. That was not an invitation. But as a pastor, as elders, we think about that. So, so pray for the elders daily, regularly, for the future elders that God will call to serve here. Pray for one another. So as you pray for the elders in our response, that our motives would be pure and right and holy in accordance to the gospel, pray for one another in responding to the elders and how we lead. Sometimes those decisions are easy and you just think it, it is like, Butter on a hot knife is just going to flow right off, and, and there you go. But other times it's not. So pray. Pray for the elders. Pray for each other. And thank God. I'm, I'm thankful for all of you. We are thankful for all of you. And every sheep that God brings into this fold here at Redeemer Church. And as the church grows, knowing the situations that I, I, I know of churches where there's been this immediate growth and, and just how to handle that. Ours has been slow. So pray for the elders and future elders. Pray for one another. And by God's grace, at the elders that are presented to you when they are presented, again, Paul gives no quantifiers as to every year you must present someone, and I'm saying this because it's a responsibility that we have as an elder board and a responsibility we have as a church to not put someone up to be an elder that really shouldn't be there. These are the qualifications. Popularity isn't in these qualifications here. If you look at these positive qualifications, underlying all that is humility. So let's pray. Father, we do pray for the elders here at Redeemer. How grateful we are to serve in this capacity, knowing that every and all situations are not easy, that it's challenging, that at times it's even heartbreaking. but such is life in a fallen world, even in Christ's church, unfortunately. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, asking for strength and wisdom and discernment as a church body. We, we give you thanks, O God, for these verses before us and considering these. We pray, Lord, that by your grace and through the work of your spirit and the ministry and work of the word, that when elders and flock, as we together wrestle with various things at times, that more than anything else, that the gospel and Christ are at the forefront of decisions made and discussed And as elders, we often come back to a text like this or a text in Titus. So that in fighting would never, ever, by your grace, O oh God, even be a part of or an inkling in this particular church here at Redeemer. To be true light and darkness 
to reflect the love of Christ and what has been shown to us and the beauty of the gospel we can then reflect and speak of to others. We pray for us as a church. How you have kept us from times past into the present and even into the future. For the future men that you may call to serve in this office of elder. And how grateful we are for the work you are doing in us and through us as a congregation, as a whole, and in us and through us as individuals for those who are in Christ. Thank you, Father. We thank you, Jesus, because we could not go about and do this and be this way apart from what you accomplished on Calvary's cross and how we are drawn back to our Savior. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, as you constantly show us areas in our lives and in my life specifically, in our lives specifically as individuals, areas for growth and change to reflect Christ better, to reflect our Father better in working out our own salvation, not to live in sinless perfection on this earth, for that is not only unacceptable, it's unbiblical thinking. But we acknowledge the necessity of your help, O oh God, through the ministry of the word particularly, and the ministry of one another specifically as well. For your glory and your glory alone, O oh God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together, His mercy is more.